All right. This is the IBM PC, the original, the classic, once again. Um, we're going to take a deeper look at uh, some of the components. Um, let's start with the processor over here. This is an AMD 8088. It is a uh, second source. It is an Intel design made with Intel masks, from what I understand. Uh, these uh, chips ran at 4.77 megahertz which is four-thirds the NTSC color burst frequency. And that frequency is 3.579 something, 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 repeating on forever. Um, it's kind of, you know, interesting uh, trivia for you guys out there. Um, this CPU ran at a peak 0.75 million instructions per second when run at 10 megahertz. Um, in the IBM PC, since it had a clock speed of 4.77 megahertz, mentioned earlier, uh, if you actually work the math backwards, you come up with 0.36 MIPS. Actually, I think it's about 3.354 something. I don't know. I don't have a calculator on me, and I don't do math that well in my head. A few more interesting details is this chip actually runs at 5 volts, uh, which is pretty high voltage when you consider all these uh, new machines. They're running at uh, cores of 1.8 or 1.2 volts. Um, this thing had a grand and whopping 29,000 transistors in there. 29,000 transistors. Our processors are what? In the billions of transistors these days? Uh, let's go ahead and move on to the uh, 8087 math coprocessor there. Uh, that thing also runs between uh, 4 and 10 megahertz, depending on what you clock it at. Um, it has a peak performance of 50,000 floating point operations per second when run at 10 megahertz. It uh, consumes about 2.5 watts is a lot of power uh, comparatively back in the day. Um, today you have CPUs that are running and burning hundreds of watts, well 125 watts plus or minus a little bit here and there. Uh, that FPU uh, has 45,000 transistors in it, which is quite a few. And I went ahead and did the math for you. And at uh, 4.77 megahertz, which that FPU runs at, we uh, come up with 23,850 flops as a peak. Now, it doesn't always run. It only runs when the CPU tells it, hey, we have a floating point operation. Let's go ahead and shove some math over here where you can do it in a few clock cycles versus taking a few hundred clock cycles if the CPU actually handles it. Um, so those are those two chips, the uh, main processor and the math coprocessor. Co -processor. If uh, we look down here at this chip, this is the P8259. That is a programmable interrupt controller. And what that does is it interrupts things or tells things, hey buddy, I need you to hold on and pay attention to me real quick we got some work to do and uh, it also tells other things hey stop the CPU is busy and that's good for uh, when uh, you have a whole lot of processing doing processing going on and you have to stop it to handle a request from a card say a sound card needs to get some information to pump the sound out it says hey processor stop what you're doing give me a second all right, I need to fetch this data so we can uh, play some music, and in just a second, you can go back to doing what you're doing. Um, you know, you kind of need something like that in any modern processor, processor, or even ancient antique processor like this one. A lot of times, they're actually built into the CPUs now, or even MCUs, that's uh, microcontroller units. Um, FPGAs sometimes have hard silicone for them, or silicon, sorry. Um, there's a couple of different ways to uh, deal with interrupts. One 
harness, you can pull and continuous say, continuously check everything. Hey, do you have any information for me? Hey, do you have any information for me? Hey, oh shit, you got something. Let's, uh, let's, let's take care of your problem. What you got, man? Or the way these interrupt controllers work most of the time is they wait to be tapped on the shoulder. And they do your, you know, their own thing, the processor's doing its own thing, and then uh, tap on the shoulder. Oh, hey, buddy, what you got? So, you know, it makes things a lot more efficient in the long run. Uh, next, we have kind of an oddball chip up here. You can't really read it, uh, but that part has a weird part number. The part starts with a D. seems like most of the Intel chips start with a P, but it's, this one starts with a D, and it's a bus controller. And um, couldn't find a whole lot of detailed information on that one. Uh, but what it does is it kind of arbitrates who gets to talk and when. So if the CPU is talking to the FPU, it tells everybody else, hold on for just a second. I got to handle this first. So just hang there. And then it's the interrupt controller's job to start tapping people on the shoulder and interrupting. And say, hey, buddy, I got something for you. So those two chips kind of work together and make sure all the communication between all the main chips happens efficiently. Uh, next up, we have that chip right there. This guy. Notice it is... Oh, wait a minute. That's not the chip I want. The chip I want is right here. Is that the chip I want? Yeah, that's the chip I want. That chip is the Intel 8284. It is a custom clock oscillator IC. Notice it's right next to this uh, crystal, and there's a couple of traces going from this crystal to one of the pins on that chip. I don't know if you can see it or no, but there's also one pin from that crystal going to this uh, pot. Or no, it's not a pot. That is a variable capacitor. And the other side goes into another pin. And you can tweak and tune the frequency of that crystal just a little bit to make sure it's exactly that uh, four thirds that NTSC color burst signal once it's divided down by that clock chip. Um, and then we have over here some other magic goodies. That top chip is the P8255A-5. It's like, really? Did they have five revisions? They had to go through that chip five times to get it right? I don't know what the dash five really stands for, but that's my guess. They, uh, they had to fix it a couple times to get it just perfect for this PC. And that chip is a programmable peripheral interface. It uh, talks to serial ports and stuff like that program various peripherals for communication talks with the buses and everything else the next chip down right there hopefully you all can read this in high def that is the P8237A-5 are we noticing a little bit of a pattern here there seems to be a lot of these dash fives um, that is a DMA controller or direct memory access controller. This particular one has four channels. And uh, what that does is it allows various components to directly stuff memory or fetch memory from the main system's pool of RAM and shuffle data around between, like, say, a floppy disk and a, I don't know, video card stuff memory directly without having to go through the processor so we can kind of get a few extra uh, clock cycles of work done in the processor without having to handle simple things like moving memory around. It's some good stuff. The uh, next chip down there is the P8253-5, again with that dash 5. That is a programmable interval timer. It is an uber souped up 555 chip. Um, that's driven by the system clock and, well, it's programmable. Um, that BIOS chip, yeah, that stands for Basic Input Output System, that allows the entire computer to have kind of a, a memory map 
that says where what things are located. It also has some built-in special functions or miniature programs written for handling various system maintenance stuff that happens to have, uh, go on when the system boots up. It checks to make sure the memory is correct and there's no problems with the memory. It checks to make sure there's communication between the processor and coprocessor and it does that check out correctly. Does the coprocessor even there? Um, it handles a lot of basic functions before the system boots up and even while the system boots up. It handles uh, uh, a tiny program that does access to the floppy drives or tape disks or wait that's tape drive and floppy disk we're gonna have a floppy disk special one of these days I swear anyways let's go ahead and continue on um, I do believe that is an 8k uh, chip I believe all of these ROM slots here are maximum of 8k which you know that's nothing major but that's kind of par for the course way back in the day uh, so that was the BIOS chip then we come to this guy this guy this guy and this guy so all those four chips those believe it or not are a ROM basic this thing had a uh, tuned up version of Microsoft basic that uh, IBM did some little tweaking to to give it some graphical capabilities with their special video cards and there are four of them there so that means there's a total of 32k of uh, well basic um, that last socket down at the end that thing well it's empty that's for future expansion I don't believe it was ever really used there may have been some special applications where it was used for something I am not aware of it though over here we briefly went over the RAM once before um, but we'll you know go over a little bit more in depth um, you have these RAM chips here in various banks bank 0 bank 1 bank 2 bank 3 and these all have the part number of MCM 46 oops nope that's 4116 BP25 now on these old DRAM chips, that those last two digits, that's actually the speed in nanoseconds, sort of. That 25 is actually 250 nanoseconds. That means the peak speed of these RAMs is 4 megahertz. So they're either overclocking the RAMs from the factory and running them at 4 megahertz, or as I suspect, that uh, chip up there, the uh, oscillator chip, um, that thing is dividing the frequency down to something a little more usable, probably divide by two or maybe 30%. And um, we're driving those chips at half of the processor clock speed or a third of the clock processor clock speed. That's going to be my guess. And um, yeah, half is my guess. Half the speed is my guess. So yeah. Anyways, so uh, 250 nanoseconds, that's... Uh, what? Uh, 4 megahertz. I should be able to do that much faster off the top of my head. Um, anyways, they're all 16-bit chips that are, sorry, they're all 16,384-bit chips. And there's eight of them, so that means there's 16,384 bytes. So, each one of these banks is actually 16 kilobytes. Wow, that is a lot of RAM, right? <clears throat> yeah, so we have four of those. Let's see, uh, 16 times four, that's uh, what, 64? So 64 kilobytes of RAM in this machine. That's a lot. And if you notice, we have, just a little bit farther down here, these four extra chips. What would those be for? Those don't make any reasonable sense um, unless they're for parody. What is parody, you might ask? No, not Airplane, the movie, or um, 2001, A Space Travesty. Nothing so crude. This is actually for error correction or error detection. If it says 
O, while these bits are all add up to something even, we make this one odd. Therefore, if, the, if we ever have a number that is non-odd, we know there's a fault, and we can redo the operation, or we can crash the computer, or whatever. I don't know if I explained that very well. Um, we might, I might do a whiteboard on it as soon as my whiteboard sh shows up, so I can kind of diagram it out and show exactly what's happening with parity. But if eight bits are all, you know, the one zero 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 one, whatever, um, if it all equals an odd number, we flip that bit, so the total becomes even. And if it's ever not even, we know there's a problem. That's that's all parity is really doing. Um, there, it, as computers got more advanced, they started doing some neat, tricky stuff with some uh, high-speed algorithms and some math and a bunch of other crazy, kooky stuff that allowed them to actually detect and repair the errors, uh, sometimes with extra bits and sometimes not with extra bits. Um, but then it started getting really expensive. You never really saw it in desktops. It's more of a server Anyways, so I also thought I might mention this little box right there, that little piece of wi yellow wire. That's kind of interesting just because way back in the day it cost so much money to do a second or third or fourth prototype board even for IBM that they frequently didn't do it very often unless they had to. Um, so it was cheaper to pay someone on the assembly line to lift a couple pins when they were soldering this thing and go ahead and hand solder a repair. You know, it might cost them an extra buck on top of the cost of the board, but it's better than a $10,000 prototype board. Even then, you know, back in 1981, ten grand that's a lot of money. Nobody wants to spend that kind of cash to fix a little repair, unless you can get away with it. So, that is the uh, motherboard a little more in depth on the IBM PC. The, the interesting thing about this is there's nothing different on this board than in a modern computer. Everything's much more integrated. The RAM has, you know, special slots for a card to sit in for it to, uh, a RAM card to go into, DRAM card, or DDR3, DDR4, DDR whatever, you know, that, that, that slick little PC board, it's got all those little chips on it, that is fundamentally nothing different than what I was just talking about with the RAM. Even the BIOS bits over here, um, fundamentally nothing different, your PC still has a BIOS, it's more, much more advanced handles a lot more features. Sometimes there's even a miniature operating system in it. Fundamentally does the same thing. All the interrupt controllers, all the programmable timers, everything else on here. It's the same stuff even on brand new machines. Thank you guys for watching. Have a wonderful weekend or wonderful week or whatever day of the week it is for you or morning or evening. Take it easy. Have fun. Bye guys.